Unfolding the eternal excellences, the hidden insights of the truth and the depth of the riches of wisdom and knowledge. The Bible says, I have cleansed thee by the word. I have not pointed to your weaknesses. He says, I have cleansed thee by the word. I have pointed to your strength. And this is your strength, that I am Christ in you, the hope of glory. The glory of freedom, the glimpses into eternity. The gospel is not supposed to be an assumption. It's not supposed to be just a mere presupposition. Truth is older than language, but the Word of God is way deeper than any human language. And now, Apostle Grace with the Word. Tonight I want to talk about the baptisms. The doctrine of the what? The baptisms. The doctrine of the baptisms. Somebody shout Amen. Now, when it comes to the baptism, baptism, the doctrine of baptism, the doctrine of baptisms, I need to invite to you or tell you that there are three major definitions in the area and line of doctrine of baptisms. One, we deal with baptism as a noun the word baptism as a noun and the Greek word for baptism as a noun is baptisma and the word baptism which translates from the Greek as baptisma is represented in the New Testament 22 times are you following me then we have another verb this is not a noun but a verb what is a verb It's a doing word right which is baptized and the word baptized is the Greek word baptizo and baptizo in scripture is represented 80 times are we following me so baptizo which is baptized is 80 times uh, baptism which is baptisma is 22 times and then there is a word called baptismos all right baptismos now hebrews 6 2 when he speaks of the doctrine of baptisms he's not talking about the doctrine of baptizo which is baptized he's not talking about the doctrine of baptisma which is baptism He's talking about the doctrine of baptismos, which is the doctrine of washing or purifications. Somebody said hallelujah. That's the Greek word. It's a washing or purification effected by means of water. In fact, that kind of washing predominantly was prescribed in the Mosaic law. Praise God. The Mosaic law. It's the same as ablution. Muslims, no ablution. Those of you who are Muslims or in a Muslim school, you remember what they used to call wudu, right? A guy washes his hands three times, then he washes his face three times, then he washes his ears, then he washes his hands, then he washes his feet, and then there he's ready for swalah to al khayl bil You understand what I'm saying? And so if you remember, in that days of swalah to al khayl bil Unfortunately, this wasn't the case for men. But when you found a lady who had just had wudu, right? And she had just consecrated and cleaned herself. A woman was not even supposed to touch a man when she had received ablution or wudu. That would render her unclean. And in rendering her unclean, she has then to go back and have the full line of wudu. Such wudu, such that she would be pleasing to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. <laughs> Praise God. So... It's a very fundamental teaching, even in the Islam faith. Oh, newsflash, this was copied from the Jews. They also had ceremonial cleansings. And the word baptismus exists only four times in the scriptures. How many? Four. And one of the times it exists is Hebrews 6, chapter Two. That is why if you read the same version, Amplified, you realize the Amplified does use the doctrine of baptisms. It calls it the teachings about purifying. 
You see that? Because baptismus was not baptizo or baptisma, which is the dipping or immersion. It was the washings or purifications that were after the cultures, the norms, the ideals, the teachings, the man-made doctrines of the Jews. You're following? Now that you understand that, let me show you the other three times besides Hebrews 6.2. The first time in Mark chapter 7 verses 3, he said, For the Pharisees and all the Jews, except they wash their hands often, they eat not, holding the traditions of elders, and when they come from the market, except they wash, they eat not, and many other things there be in which they have received to hold as the washing of cups and pots, brazen vessels and tables. And these in this instance are not cleaned because of hygiene, but they are cleaned because of tradition, because it is believed that they have some sort of grace and glory and sacredness to them that makes the things that are washed and the person who is washing or the one who is washed better in the sight of God. These things gave men an impression that they would draw closer in righteousness, in holiness, in acceptation from God because they were doing these things. So these things are more of traditions handed over. They're not washing hands because they don't want to get germs, but they're washing hands because traditionally when you wash hands, you're more righteous to God than the man who did not wash. And some even after market, they used to come and bathe because those were traditions. The word used there for the word wash is baptismos. Okay? The next time it's written is in the same chapter, verses 8. He says, For laying aside the commandment of God, you hold the tradition of men as the washing of pots and cups and many such things ye do. It's the same likeness, the same washing there. Is These were not the commandments of God, but these were doctrines of men. And in that time, Jesus realizes and Paul through scripture shows men that even after the cross and the ascension of Jesus Christ, these doctrines stayed where men were washing, cleaning themselves, bathing a certain way to fulfill a certain righteousness before God. And the third or fourth time it's written is Hebrews chapter 9 verses 8 where he says the Holy Ghost did signify or the Holy Ghost did signifying that the way into the holiest of all was not yet made manifest while the first tabernacle was standing. The revelation of the holiest of holies, the holy of holies, which is the holiest place of worship the deepest place on manifestation of the presence of God on earth. It was not a revelation. It was a place known by the Jews, but it was not a revelation. It was not a place the whole Jew community could go except the high priest that went there in service in lieu of the sins of people that he might pay the ultimate service toward God that their sins might be purged or covered. You understand? So the Holy Ghost started speaking of a time in signification uh, which the Bible says the way into the holiest of all was not made manifest while the first tabernacle was yet standing. And this, he says, was a figure. All these things I'm speaking is just shadows of figures, right? Of the time that is then present, because now if then before those were figures of worship, now we carry the present truth which gives us the present reality of worship. In other words, the New Testament church does not worship in shadows. It worships in the reality, the substance, the essence of Christ. Somebody shout hallelujah. And because of that, he says that this was a figure for the time then present in which were offered both gifts and sacrifices that could not make him that did the service perfect as pertaining to the conscience. And as those things were done, that they were not making men perfect concerning the conscience, which stood only, he says, in meats and in drinks and in diverse baptismos, diverse washings and carnal ordinances imposed on them until the time of reformation, until the time when God was able to get into the minds of men and help them understand, separate the shadows from the substance, separate the figures from the reality. When that reformation comes through, it is the only way the church had access to the deepest presence of the anointing of the spirit and that happens when the veil in the temple is rent into two and now all of us have access into the holiest of holies through faith somebody shout hallelujah you can clap for that so but before that because it was not a revelation only the priest would go there by reason of god's mercy 
that he might preserve himself a generation until the coming of Jesus Christ. And I tell people, some people ask questions. And some of you probably personally ask yourselves questions and say, you know, I have questions. Why is it that today we don't see much power and glory and anointing in the church like we used to see back in the book of Acts or even before the cross? And I tell people simply, we cannot have biblical results if we've lost the biblical pattern. It doesn't matter how much tradition has conceived and been conceived in our dispensation and some men are ready to let go of reality and truth for the fear of tradition, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the Easterns and all that are before us. Instead then we choose to fear those and then not fear the word of God. Today men are in service to men more than they are in service to God. And because we've lost the biblical pattern, we have lost the biblical power. We're only uh, empty teams making noise in many circles of Christian faith. But that is not for long. The power of God will be seen. And it's like the same instance of the children of Israel, where many of them are not able to access the Holy of Holies because their minds are not reformed in the progression of the gospel in the appointed times when it is appointed. Now, when you are in present truth, you must understand that the things that are applicable in your life now might not be the things that you apply in the Old Testament dispensation, like I've been teaching in repentance of dead works, then faith toward God and what that means. And in faith toward God, I taught about how you have to learn to build a personal altar than relying on another man's oil and incense to build your own life. Somebody shout hallelujah. And I would have preferred to teach only in the washings and the carnal ordinances to emphasize the fact and reality that in Jesus' time and after Jesus' time in the days of Paul, these washings ensued. And many times many people were doing very many outward things to establish an inward relationship. And when Paul speaks about the foundation of doctrine, it is because the issue of the baptism is a very fundamental doctrine to Jesus Christ. But here, he was talking about the washings. I wonder why Paul avoided baptism and baptizo. You realize in the doctrine of Christ, baptizo is not mentioned in the foundationals. You realize baptism, which is the immersion by water, it's not in the foundational doctrine of the Christian faith. Praise God. What is there is baptismos. And some of you, because you read the word doctrine of baptisms, you think that God infers or refers to baptizo or baptismas. Don't make the scripture say what it's not saying. Here, he emphasized more on the washings, but he never spoke about the water baptism. And there's a reason why. Praise God. Now, let's go in the baptisms. Let's go in your baptizos and baptism. Let's address the 80 times, right? And the 22 times it's mentioned. More so in the Gospels, but very little in the letters after the New Testament has begun. There's a reason why when you go into the New Testament, there is no fundamental teaching and instruction on water baptism and all these other things. So we ask then, wow, or why do we baptize? We're going to get to that. But I need to first introduce you to two kinds of baptisms before we get into the one of water. The first one was in 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verses 1, uh, where he says, Moreover, brethren, I would note that you should be ignorant how that by all our fathers were under the cloud and passed through the sea and were all baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea and did eat the same spiritual meat and all drink the same spiritual drink for they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them and that rock was Jesus Christ. He gives us an interesting life of baptism. And he says, oh, when you talk about the children of Israel, they were actually in a way baptized under Moses, but they were baptized in the cloud and they were baptized in the sea because Paul is giving this cloud and the sea as a figure and representation sort of baptism. Why? Because if you think about it in the literal sense, clouds hold water. And if you go through clouds, it means you're literally being immersed into a sort of water, although a lighter form of it. You understand? Or if you talk about baptism in the sea, when God gets to the sea and he separates the waters, for the children of Israel to pass which sinks the sheep and families of Pharaoh, you realize that that same water that is parted in principle, they actually passed through water. Even though it did not touch them, they actually passed through water. 
Paul defines that as what? As baptism. Then we have another thing called the baptism of the dead. 1 Corinthians 15, 29. I believe this is one of the most controversial baptisms that I have read on any commentators of the Bible. Many of them, when they get there, they don't have an answer for that. They ask, hmm, what is baptism of the dead? And probably some of you, it's the first time you're reading it. He says, else what shall they do which are baptized for the dead if the dead rise not at all? And why are they then baptized for the dead? So Paul tells us there's actually such a thing as baptism of the dead. But for me, when I studied this scripture, I was praying and I felt that the Holy Spirit impressed to me and told me, look, follow the pattern of the content in scripture, then you'll get the meaning of the baptism of the dead. And if you go back a bit to verses 27, it says, then he has put all things under his feet, but when he says all things are put under him, it is manifest that is accepted which did put all things under him. And verses 28 says, and when all things shall be subdued under him, then shall the Son also himself be subject and to him that put all things under him, that God may be all in all. And he says, else what? Listen, shall they do which are baptized for the dead? If the dead rise not at all, why are they then baptized for the dead? But if you continue, he continues to say, and why stand we in jeopardy every hour? He's trying to give us the clue of the baptism of the dead. He says, I protest by your rejoicing which I have in Christ Jesus. I die daily. He says, for if after the manner of men I have fought with beasts of Ephesus, what advantage is it for me if the dead rise not, let us eat and drink for tomorrow we die. Paul is trying to tell the church, look, I fought beasts in Ephesus, I die daily, I'm at risk of an issue of death. Paul is trying to tell us about the baptism of the dead, which is the deliberate heart in men who have availed themselves to the point of dying for the sake of the gospel. That's martyrdom. So the baptism of the dead is actually a baptism of martyrdom. People who have given their lives and are even at the verge of even losing it in the name of the gospel. So he's then asking, what then shall they do which are martyrs if the dead rise not at all? And why are they baptized for the dead? Why then do they become martyrs? if there is no hope of resurrection. You see? So he's talking about the baptism of the dead, which is martyrdom. Praise God. But then we touch now the issue of water baptism. Let's go the way of water baptism. Praise God. We want to touch the teaching of water baptism. To teach water baptism, I will beg you that we follow the pattern of progressive knowledge than simply identifying a few scriptures here and there to give justification to the argument of water or any other way you want to look at it. I would rather you look at the progressive pattern. You know, many years when I had this question, the Spirit of the Lord said the exact words I've repeated to you. He said, if you want to understand this issue of baptism, you must follow the progressive pattern of knowledge, revelation, and wisdom of the church as it happens through the ages, then in present truth, 2019, you'll have an answer for water baptism. So walk with me. Remember, the challenge, which should be not be a challenge, but the challenge begins when Mark says, for those that believe and are baptized, they shall be saved. And he says, but he that believeth not is done. This is Jesus. Jesus told them, go into the world, preach the good news, uh, the gospel to every creature. This is Jesus before he ascends. And he says, and he that believeth, he says, he is baptized and shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be done. So we see that he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. But if you look at that rendering in Mark 16, 16, it's not he that believeth, comma, and is baptized shall be saved. It is he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. It's one sentence. Meaning the believing and the baptism are one here. They are not two separate activities. I want you to note that. So we are going to go a bit deeper to understand what it means by that. But let's begin with understanding how water baptism begins. Okay? And the first line of teaching and introduction would be what I want to call the baptism of John. I want you to write that down. The baptism of what? Of John. Some of you prefer to call him the Baptist. 
I love how John renders him. John calls him the baptizer. Okay? And I prefer that rendering. You'll understand why. I prefer calling him the baptizer like John refers to him and not the baptist, like some of you call him. In Mark chapter 1 verses 4, the Bible says, John did baptize in the wilderness and preach the baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. And there went out unto him all the land of Judea and they of Jerusalem and were all baptized of him in the river of Jordan, confessing their sins. John introduced the time, the era, the age, the teaching of baptism, of repentance for the remission of sins. That was John's revelation and that was the revelation that was necessary for that time because he was going to usher a greater move of a man called Jesus Christ. Somebody shout hallelujah. Indeed, Jesus comes and then um, he's baptized uh, by John. We shall come back to that later. And then Jesus also continues in the same work. And we see that in uh, John chapter 3, verses 22, the Bible says, And after these things came Jesus and his disciples into the land of Judea, and there he tarried with them and baptized and John was also baptizing in Enon near to Salim because there was much water there and they came and they were baptized. So we start to see that not only was Jesus baptized, but he carries on the same teaching of John the Baptist and he continues baptizing. So we say, hmm, okay, so who are those people Jesus deliberately, personally dipped into water? Because later on we start to see a certain competition between the disciples of John the Baptist and the disciples then that had started following Jesus Christ. And later we start to see a war ensuing between the two. Some are saying Jesus is baptizing. And we see the disciples of John coming to him telling him, Hey, do you know that Jesus now is baptizing more people than you? You understand? In other words, now they're trying to create competition between two men that are fulfilling divine purpose and with whom there is no competition between because their personal assignments are given. And that has continued up to today in present day church. Many people do not understand the holistic ministry of the body of Christ. And some people judge other men for how they do their things and how others do. The other one does this. Me, I want the one who does this. You go to the one who does whatever you want to. Are you hearing me? Every man is given an assignment. Are you hearing me? And God will judge them based on the assignment he has given them. Don't put competition between ministers of the gospel. Somebody shout hallelujah. It still happens. But in John chapter 4, he says, When therefore the Lord knew how the Pharisees had that Jesus made and baptized more disciples than John, I love the way verse 2 says, verse 2 says, Though Jesus himself baptized not, but his disciples did. In other words, when you go to John 3, 22 and 23, where the Bible says Jesus baptized, now John, the next chapter 4, tells us actually, that even though he was baptizing, really, but it was not him personally baptizing, he actually used to tell his disciples to baptize. That means Jesus personally, by scripture record, he has never baptized the man personally in water. I want you to understand that. But also I want you to keep in the mind as I'm teaching that even John the baptizer was never on record baptized by any man even though Jesus was baptized under John. So that's where the real question comes. Why is Jesus baptized under John, but he personally does not baptize, yet he promotes the ministry of baptism through his disciples. And yet John, the one which baptized him, was actually not baptized. That is the fundamental what? Question. Somebody shout hallelujah. And that progresses now in the time of Matthew chapter 3 and verses 11 when John the Baptist is speaking. Now we are taken in the time of John the Baptist because I want to answer that question for you. John is not baptized, Jesus is baptized, but Jesus personally does not baptize and then he delegates his disciples to baptize. Why? Okay. Matthew chapter 3 verses 11, the answer comes. John says, I indeed baptize you with water and to repentance, but he that cometh after me is mightier than I. That is why I prefer to call this baptism the baptism of Christ, and I always put in brackets, one who is mightier. 
because John said it. He says, I indeed baptize you with water and to repentance, but he that cometh after me is mightier than I, whose shoes I am not worthy to bear. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. The one who is coming, does he baptize by water? Hey, does he baptize by water? He baptizes by the Holy Spirit and by what? By fire. Those are the two we know him of to baptize. Now, John is trying to bring something here. And true to form, in just two verses after 14, Jesus appears. In verses 13, he says, and then Jesus comes from Galilee. After John has spoken, he says that indeed I baptize by water, but he that cometh shall baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. And in 13 verse, Jesus comes from Galilee to Jordan and to John to be baptized of him. Now, John knows that the one coming is mightier. And the mightier one is coming to Jordan to be dipped into water. And verses 14 now tells us, but John forbade him. John refused, saying, I have need to be baptized of thee, and thou comest unto me. In other words, I know what the Spirit does and the baptism of the Holy Spirit and of fire, and I am doing that of water, and this is of an inferior and of a less power than the one you are having. So why are you then you, which comes with a greater baptism, why then do you come to me to baptize you? He refuses says no we are losing the order here and jesus answered and said unto him suffer it to be so now he didn't say always he said suffer it to be so now for thus it becometh us to fulfill all righteousness then he suffered him why is he fulfilling all righteousness this is the reason why he's fulfilling all righteousness because it was the relevant revelation and purpose of God of that age. Jesus had not yet begun his earthly ministry. There was no way he could break the purpose and order of God to establish his own doctrine of baptism when the one of order was existent at that time and the one that was existent was the dipping into the water. So Jesus says, uh -uh, I cannot break the order of the Spirit to fulfill all righteousness. Baptize me because this is what is available for the ages. God has a bigger picture as to why he wants to baptize by water now. Now is your time, John. I have not been taken to the wilderness for testation. As Jesus, I'm still in the first dimension of the spirit. I'm not healing the sick, casting out devils. My primary ministry has not yet begun. I've not even been tested as a son of God. So it befits you to baptize me because it is necessary now to fulfill all righteousness. But in the time when I was on earth, before my earthly ministry, this is Jesus speaking, I did not interfere with the ministry that was then present, which was John. So even when Jesus then is baptized as a son and all of this, the full picture of the New Testament has not begun because Jesus is baptized. His ministry has not yet begun fully. Are you hearing me? And we see the fulfillment of it is finished which in fact some people don't know that when jesus said it is finished that was the beginning of his ministry the real beginning the three years were taking us to that cross are you hearing me they were preparation of the work and so that is why we see that jesus later on knows that this is still the era of john until my death and resurrection remember the kingdom of god as from moses into the times of john has suffered what violence right so he says this is the age of john i cannot do anything against what john has and what god has ordained him to do and so if baptism is the issue then let us continue baptizing because that's the order until my death and resurrection when a new thing is going to come that is why now jesus tells his disciples because it's the age of john please baptize but jesus does not baptize jesus does not what personally but his disciples do what they do baptize because we must fulfill all righteousness. That was the necessary revelation of that generation and that age and that time. The now of Jesus' day. So do you understand why now Jesus has to be baptized? Yet he himself does not baptize. Yet he tells these disciples to baptize. 
and yet John the Baptist was not baptized, who baptized us? You get the answer now? Can we progress? Now, we get to Pentecost. Acts chapter 1 and verses 5. Jesus repeats the same words and he says, For John truly baptized with water, but she shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days from now. He has separated that again. Look, John baptizes with water. That means water baptism is John's baptism. Somebody shout hallelujah. John's baptism. That's John's baptism. He says, but ye shall be baptized. He has introduced another baptism with the Holy Spirit. So Holy Ghost not many days from now and indeed two to form in acts chapter 2 verses 4 they were all filled with the holy ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the spirit gave them utterance and then a challenge when peter is filled with the holy spirit and everybody speaking in tongues he comes out he finds three thousand men asking questions he answers them and explains the issue of their faith they tell him what should we do salvation comes they receive jesus christ in the 41st verse the bible says then they that gladly received his word were baptized and the same day were added unto them about 3,000 people. Now this is the challenge where the church has stooped. When they were filled with the Holy Spirit, the baptism of the Holy Spirit, when Peter stands before 3,000 men and teaches the word of God, okay? Remember before Jesus left, the disciples were what? were baptizing. So Peter thinks, I think this is not something that Jesus has a problem with. I think it is necessary that we baptize men because he told us to baptize in the days of John. What did they do? They got 3,000 men and did what? And baptized them. When that water baptism took place and the church continued, it was adopted as a tradition that probably the baptism of water which is of john we think maybe is also necessary alongside faith to fulfill the complete picture of salvation for mankind and it has continued up to today are you following what i'm saying but let us go scripturally and see where it ends are you following me in Acts chapter 8 there's several baptisms that are written and i'm going to be touching about three of them. In Samaria, the Bible says they believed the word. In verses 12, when they believed Philip preaching the things concerning the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, the Bible says they were baptized both men and women, and Simon himself believed also, and when he was baptized, he continued with Philip and wondered, uh, beholding the miracles and signs and wonders. Now, they were baptizing. But, because this was the New Testament and Jesus had gone, they would not baptize men only for the repentance to the remission of sins only, but then in which name are we baptizing? Because baptism of repentance, are you hearing me? For the remission of sins, it continues even after the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ because it almost was familiar to what John was doing and Jesus left them doing and he never commented much about it though himself he never did it, yet he told them to do it. So they think if Jesus wasn't against this, even though he's a baptizer of the Holy Ghost and with fire, then probably there is no problem with this. So it was adopted as something that I think is acceptable. Okay? So we see Simon uh, baptized. We see many believers baptized. We go down in verses 14. When the apostles were at Jerusalem and heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent Peter and John, who when they had come down, pray for them that they might receive the Holy Ghost, that people might speak in tongues. For yet he had not fallen upon any of them. Only they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. That means they were immersed in the name of the Lord Jesus. That means from the time of the ascension of Jesus Christ, no longer were they saying we are baptizing you for the repentance of sins for salvation. Now they used to use the word, we rebaptize you in the name of Jesus. Then they get you out. In the name of Jesus. Because he tells them, he that believeth and is baptized shall be what? Saved. So they are continuing. They think that they are continuing a tradition. And it is happening and I'm showing it to you before all of these. And uh, here, in this instance in Samaria, many of them 
had not received the baptism of the Holy Spirit, yet had received the baptism of water in the name of Jesus Christ. And then they now uh, brand the baptism of water as the baptism in the name of Jesus Christ. Then I ask you, if it is the baptism in the name of Jesus, why is it baptism in the name of Jesus when John clearly told you that I am the one who baptizes by water? The one coming is baptizing in the Holy Ghost and fire. So then why in his name do we baptize in water when John was clear the one coming will baptize in the Holy Ghost and with fire, with the Holy Ghost and with fire. He will not baptize with water. He will baptize with the Holy Ghost and with fire. That is the one coming. But oh no, Apostle, let me take you back to the scripture. The Bible says, he told Nicodemus, except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. So I think we're talking about this water. But when you study the word there for water, it's not baptisma or baptizo. In other words, the literal line there for water actually but will so more imply more on the cleansing of the word of God. So here he's talking about them which are born of the word and of the spirit. Because the word they are born of water is not baptisma or baptizo. It has nothing to do with immersion. But when you read the English word you think, okay, except one is born of water and of the spirit then he enters the kingdom if you say so then it means if a man has received Jesus Christ but is not yet baptized then that man can't go to heaven that is Christ plus water baptism equals salvation oh but it agrees with Mark for he that believes and is baptized he is saved but in Mark he didn't put a comma you're the one putting it because of your tradition so then I ask you a question answer me and I'll ask this by show of hands if a man has been living a very sinful life and then he gets on a deathbed and he's going to die, let's think, okay? And when that man is going to die, somebody comes to him and tells him, I want to offer you the grace and ability to receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior. And that man is led into a confession prayer. And after receiving confession, he dies. How many of you think that man goes to heaven? Put down. How many of you think he will not go to heaven because he's not yet baptized? So why does he go to heaven? Because he believed, but he said, he that believeth and is baptized, he shall be saved. A man cannot enter the kingdom except by water and of the spirit. This one, the word is spirit and life. It has been spoken to him. But then, where is the water? Has he been put under water? So how is he going to heaven? You see? I'm not saying I'm against what your answer is. I'm only trying to give reason to your answer. And this is reason for your answer. Because it is Christ and Christ alone. With a heart, a man believes and confession is made unto salvation. You understand what I'm saying? So, do I need to be water baptized to go to heaven? Okay. But then, I see the pattern in Samaria where they were first water baptized. Then they receive the Holy Spirit. So the question, do I need to first be baptized in water, then receive the Holy Spirit? The house of Cornelius is an example. Somebody shout hallelujah. Cornelius' household is an example, and I'll come to that. Now, we go in Acts again, 836, we see another baptism of the eunuch. As they went on their way, they came unto a certain what? Water and the eunuch said, See, here is water, what dost thou hinder me to be baptized? He asked, and Philip said, If thou believest with all thine heart, and thou mayst. And then he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And then he commanded the chariot to stand still, and then he went down both into the water, and both Philip and the eunuch, the eunuch was what? Was baptized. And then we see later in the house of Cornelius, chapter 10, verses 44, the Bible says, While Peter yet spoke this word, the Holy Ghost fell on them which had the word, and they of the circumcision which believed were astonished, as many as came with Peter, because that on the Gentiles also poured out the gift of the Holy Ghost, for they had them speak in tongues and magnify God. Then answered Peter, Can any man forbid water that this should not be baptized, which have received the Holy Ghost as well? And he commanded them to be baptized 
in the name of the Lord, and then prayed they him to tarry. But you see the lingering of Peter, he says, Can any man forbid water that these not be baptized which have received the Holy Ghost as well? To Peter, it's almost as though the Holy Spirit is as well, but water is the important thing. And they were baptized. But then I ask questions to men who read and I say, if water baptism was so important to God, then why did he fill the house of Cornelius with the Holy Spirit before they were dipped in water? Why did he deem them acceptable enough to give them a power on earth that is bigger than any atomic bomb and with that power the knee bows and every tongue confesses, the lame walk, the blind see, the tumors disappear and they are filled with all the fullness of God yet the water had not yet been sprouted on their bodies or their bodies had not yet been immersed. So then I ask, I ask, does God need water baptism to fill you with the Holy Spirit? No. So why then is to Peter, why to Peter is infill of the Holy Spirit as well? Why isn't it the primary thing before the water? Because they were still dealing with a bigger tradition than the infill of the Holy Spirit and they had not yet understood the full effect and consequence of the baptism of the Holy Spirit and of fire than they were acquainted to the doctrine of baptism by water of John. Indeed, this does not only end with Peter's day. In Acts 9.18, the Bible says, And immediately there fell from his eyes, this is Paul, as it has been scaled, and he received sight from with, and arose, and was baptized. It is proof that also Paul was baptized. Praise God. This ensues, we see baptisms in the whole of Acts 10 and all through. We see the baptisms in Philippi, uh, to the household of Lydia, households were baptized to the households of the jailers. So the doctrine of water baptism continues in the church area. Then a time comes. And that time comes in a time when now, those who are under Paul as an apostle are baptizing. Okay? Then those who are under Apollos as the man which waters are baptizing. Those who are under Peter also, because they remember God says on this rock I shall build. Now you see, eh? there is also a distinction between these three. Why some follow Paul? Why some follow Peter? And why some follow Apollos? Apollos is fervent in the spirit and mighty in words. Paul is the builder of the New Testament dispensation and the master builder and those that were in the presence heard. And then Peter, he, they knew Jesus who was there when Jesus was saying that on this rock I shall build. They said that on this rock I shall build my church. Why should I follow Paul? Hello? Why should I follow Paul? Jesus told Peter on this rock, hey, 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 in the car, Peter, Tim Peter, Hashtag, Tim, Peter. He said, on this rock I will build. I'm Tim Apostle Paul. He was master builder. Master builder. Okay, God will build on Peter. But master builder, foundation. Apollos, servant in the spirit, mighty in what? Do you know what it means to water? A master builder. Can a plant live without water? So dissensions ensue. And the same issue that happened between Jesus and John the Baptist has now come back to bite these three men. Paul, Apollos, and Peter, which is Cephas. But remember, Paul is starting to progress in the what? In the revelation, let us first live the days when he's born again, he's baptized, this is everyone baptizing in his first area, he's also trying to get the thing, he's getting to it. Now, Paul is trying to advance his knowledge and Corinthians 1.12 is written a bit years later. Remember, it took Paul 13 years to begin his first missionary journey. In all of those 13 years, God is preparing too much in his life and is adopting, mutating and learning the pattern and the progression of knowledge and revelation. Now, Paul says, now this I say to every one of you, says I am of Paul, and I am of Apollos, and I of Cephas, and I of Christ. 
he said, if Christ divided, was Paul crucified for you? Were you baptized in the name of Paul? Now, Paul brings that boom. He says, I thank God that I baptized none of you, but I baptized Crispus and I baptized Gaius. Least any of you should say that I baptized in mine own name. And I baptized also, he says, the house of Stephanus. And he says, besides, I know not whether I baptized any other. Paul is very clear. He says, one man, this thing called baptism. If you go through all of my years of ministry, the people I can bet that I baptized, I baptized Gaius, I baptized Crispus. If you read church history, you realize the days of Gaius, the days of Crispus were Paul's very early times of ministry when he was still trying to understand his doctrine of water baptism. And then he goes in the house of Stephanus, he preaches the gospel in the house of Stephanus, and the whole household says, Paul, you're the one to baptize us. And what does he do? Because he has seen the Peters do it, the disciples did it, there is record that Jesus told his disciples to do it. He's a disciple of Jesus, he too was baptized. It was done in the book of Acts and God didn't cast anyone out. Before the infill of the Spirit, after the infill of the Holy Spirit, it is a tradition. I don't want to break the tradition. What do we do? We also baptize them. And it's not new. Paul himself circumcised Timothy. But do we see later in Paul's later life that he changes the idea of circumcision and now he stops the issue of circumcision of flesh and then he goes into the circumcision of the heart yet he himself what? We see even events where Paul himself struggles to do certain um, festivities in the Jewish culture because he was struggling to switch the son of the Pharisee trained under Gamaliel to become a man that is perfected by God and in God. He's still fighting the issues. Water baptism really the baptism of in the name of the Lord or that is actually the baptism of John because if it's in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. That one he says, that one is with the Holy Spirit and with fire. So now, during that time we are debating, is it baptism of the Holy Spirit, is it baptism of water, or are both necessary? When Paul gets to his latest years of ministry, late life in the last years, he writes the book of Ephesians. The book of Ephesians was written in Paul's last years of life and ministry. He has matured in the world of ministry. He says in Ephesians chapter 4, verses 4, at maturity, he says, but there is one body he says and one spirit even as you are all called in one hope of your calling and he says and there is one lord and he says and there is one faith and he says and there is one baptism one god and the father of all who is above all who through all and is in you all now if there is only one baptism which one should it be of the holy ghost or of water Answer me! Scripture, not tradition, about Uganda. Scripture, not what? Not tradition. There is nothing done outside the man that can change the man inside. Our God is the God that deals with the man inside and not the man outside. Somebody shout hallelujah. So Paul has matured. He's in his last years of ministry. And now he has come to the realization that many people are trying to progressively come to. There is one Lord one faith, one baptism. From the time of Stephanus' household, Paul never baptized again by water. Am I against water baptism? In this ministry, we baptize in water for those who request. Because we want to respect you where you are. Like the house of Stephanus asked Paul. Like Gaius asked Paul. Like Crispus asked Paul. Paul, if you want us to dip you, we'll what? We'll dip you. But there is one word. That is why Pastor Sam has done a great job to dip those who want. But me, there is no man here who can say, I was baptized in water by Apostle Grace Lovega. <laughs> But I'm not against what? But it will take too much for me to dip a man. So, rule of the thumb in this ministry, if you ask, we will fold our hands and feet 
I have men who have trusted for that, but there is one way. And if you want us to think from your perspective, would you rather be dipped in the water or in the spirit? Answer me. Would you rather be dipped in the water or in the spirit? Would you rather come out with a wet body or another tongue? <laughs> <laughs> and amazingly, there are people who are dipped in water and they come back speaking in tongues. That is your faith, not the doctrine. Like a man says, if I touch that man, I'll speak in tongues. You will be done unto you according to your level of faith. But then, I would rather we emphasize the infill of the Holy Spirit by the evidence of speaking in tongues. That is why I tell people in Fanero, I don't know whether you are water baptized or not. If you are not water baptized, that's okay. You're not going to hell and God will not short circuit your ministry because of that. But everybody must be baptized in Rima, Talaba, Rabaka, Tatara, Bazeke, Tete, Sora, Babara, Mandoro, Boziba, Katalapa, Rezele, Pakatalapa, Yereba. Because if you don't have that one, you don't have a language, you don't have a speech, you don't have a story, you don't have a life of prayer that is tangible. Somebody shout hallelujah. But the baptism is one of the healthy compromises of the Christian faith. But can we advance from shadows? One Lord, one faith, one baptism. Praise God. So, I want you to just raise your voice and thank God for revelation. <laughs> Listen, don't repent for having been water baptized. You did not sin. You did not what? You did not sin. You didn't do anything wrong. No man has sinned by water baptism. It's like eating bread. There's nothing wrong with eating bread. You understand? Hallelujah. But just raise your hands and thank God for the advancement of revelation. And that you grow in the knowledge of Him. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Speak in other tongues. And if you're here and you've never been filled with the Holy Spirit, with the evidence of speaking in tongues, I want you to raise your hands up in the air. Right now, the anointing of speaking in other tongues is coming upon you and your lips are going to start speaking a foreign language. Receive it in the mighty name of Jesus. and father in the name of jesus on behalf of every man here we raise our spirits our hearts to receive the things that are for maturation the meat that are for them which are mature and to thank you for counting us worthy of all acceptation to receive these words today and to ask as a ministry we stand on the fulfillment of the word and the qualifications that have been laid in scripture that allow us to say that there is one body one spirit even if we are called in one hope of our calling one lord one faith one baptism one god the father of all who is above all and through all and in our soul to him be glory now and forever give him a mighty hand clap of praise come on clap for jesus praise god so if you're here and you've never given your life to jesus christ you're here and you say apostle i've had this thing i want to receive jesus as my lord i want my life to change from today i want to be born again I want to connect to that God who died for me. I want to receive the fullness of baptism of the Holy Spirit and of fire 
tonight I want to receive him as my Lord and Savior. I want to be born again and a new creation and enter the present truth and the life after the cross. I want you to repeat these words after me. Say, Lord Jesus, I thank you for your word tonight. My heart has received your word. I believe in my heart and I confess with my mouth that you are Lord and born again. Amen. God bless you. The message you have just heard was brought to you by Fenero Ministries International. For more information, contact us on telephone number 41 466 4291 or email us at fenerocompala at gmail.com. You can also find us on the web at www.fenero.org or better still, feel free to join us every Thursday for our weekly fellowship at UMA Multipurpose Hall from 5 p.m. to 8 p.m. You can also catch the live stream at livestream.com slash Fenero. Fenero, make manifest.